Time to talk about V&T moguls and about paint colors, and I'm going to throw you for a little loop. Um, we're going to tag team this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Jim and I had a little conversation, and he suggested he could help, and I decided that maybe he would be the second half of the talk. So today, I'm going to talk about the locomotives. I'm going to talk about the color systems, the way Baldwin would create things, and then since Jim's here, and Jim knows substantially more about it than I do or anybody else, um, we're going to let Jim talk about the details of paint. So we'll see if we can make this thing work. We can't. So the reason we're here, of course, talking about it is these brass models. They're over in the contest room. They're imminent. Um, and for those of you who have purchased one, some point in the near future, you have to decide how to paint it. Well, you don't have to. You could put it up on a shelf and leave it in brass, but if you're going to use it on your railroad. We're pretty sure the photos are all in black and white, but we're pretty sure that they weren't painted in brass. <laughs> so, talking about moguls in general on the VNT. 29 locomotives at seven. Oh, VNT had 29 locomotives. There were five wheel arrangements. There were 17 of them were moguls, the dominant wheel arrangement. They come from three different builders, and they're built to five different drawings. Of the 17, eight were Baldwin class, 826D, or 27 D. It's the same thing, built to drawing two. And that's this engine. So we're going to come back and concentrate on this engine and how this engine looked. But it's still important to talk about the engines in general. Okay. Uh, before the Baldwins, we have the Booths or the Union Ironworks engines. Um, Lion, we're very excited. Lion may eventually be seen again. Story, or Ormsby, which is identical to Lion. Slightly larger Story. I, this photograph is great because this photograph has, down on the right is the engine in Canada later. Look at how ornate, and look at what it looks like. That may look similar to some things you see from Baldwin later on. We get two engines from Danforth Cook. Um, they buy these kind of out of an emergency need. Baldwin cannot supply engines fast enough. These have already been built. I think a South American railroad. Um, they're a little bigger. They're a long wheelbase. You look between those drivers, the driver wheelbase. They were restricted to Reno to Carson. They didn't last long. Picture of one of them. This is, again, the beautiful engine. They were very long lived engines, not bad engines, just not good engines for the VT. Were they all flyers? Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, big rigid engines. Okay, so the real engines that we're talking, kind of focusing down on what we're interested in, uh, Baldwin Locomotive Works, uh, particularly in the 19th century, utterly dominant locomotive works, um, the locomotive works that V&T prefers. Um, there in their catalog cut, middle right, there's a mogul because it's an important wheel arrangement for Baldwin. They purchased two groups. Up above, the earlier ones, uh, the ones that match the brass model that we're all waiting for. Um, down below, the later ones. Um, they're a little different. Uh, you can see one has a wagon top boiler, one has a straight boiler. The steam dome moves forward, the sand dome moves forward, the bell moves back. Um, a little bigger engine for the later ones. Um, so we're going to concentrate on the top, but we're going to use the, the later engines to talk about paint a little bit because they better match the Baldwin system and maybe get us organized so we understand what Jim's presenting. This lovely photo, the two of them coupled. Ahead is a later mogul in style one. Behind is the earlier design. Instead of a panel, we have the stripes. Um, an early photo. Okay, so mobile type Baldwin, these were catalog engines. Nobody told Baldwin exactly what to build. Somebody called Baldwin and said, 
I want one of these, and there would have been some questions about your grade and your curvatures, and Baldwin would have sent you an engine built that anybody else could have bought it. This, this is not custom work. So what's important with Baldwin being huge is Baldwin had a set of standards to allow it to build engines. They didn't just call Joe on the factory floor and say, build another one. There was a series, of, and they didn't draw a new drawing for every locomotive. They didn't have time. So they have a series of things that they use. They have a specification sheet, um, a sheet where they list what this engine is supposed to be, all the things you're supposed to know from boiler size, from cylinder size, gauge of the railroad, basic stuff that the factory needs to know about your railroad. They have a book of laws, and a book of laws, the book of laws is at its most basic. It includes what machine thread looks like, because Baldwin's creating these engines in a time before SAE or any of the other standard threads. They're having to figure out how to cut a thread. What is the angle on a thread? How many threads to the inch? So in the book of laws, we have things like that. We have funny little laws that say, when you're painting the name on a tender, do not use R period R. Do not use R period, RY period, unless specified. So if we tell it's a Virginian Truckee Railroad, the painter has to spell out railroad. If we put in quotes and say R period R, he's allowed to do it. But laws are very detailed, they change over time. There's a book of cards. There's the Book of Styles, and we'll be talking about the Book of Styles a great deal. And there's some finish schedules. So it all comes back for most of our engines to the specification sheets. Um, on the right, I think I've got one of the, I've got Empire, and um, it's one of, the, one of the last of the small bald ones. On the left, it's, I think, Comstock. Real important thing here, though, Okay. The earlier engines are called 27 and a half D15. Uh, 15 is a unique number for this engine. The other is a description of the engine to Baldwin. Up here, for the later engines, there are 26 Ds, and again, numbers 24, I think. Um, these, in the middle of the small Baldwins, Baldwin changes the rules. Turned out the old system didn't work as well as it did. Um, but you can kind of look at the sheets. Um, we start off with gauge. We end up here with a headlight. So we discussed that yesterday. Somewhere in between, we have general finish good here. We have painting wine color, telling them a lot about it. We don't have a lot of decoration information in these. Okay, so starting off with that class, that change of class, and this is from the Baldwin Law Book, Classification of Engines. They are gonna tell you now, this is late in the book, 111, this is the book from the drawing room at Baldwin, it's at Stanford now. Um, how does the class system work? That old 27 and a half D didn't work well. 27 and a half was trying to give you an idea how big the engine was in weight. And engines have changed weight proportions as technology goes. The D is telling you it has six driving wheels. But nothing in 27 and a half D tells you how, or actually it tells you it has six driving wheels, doesn't tell you if it has a lead truck. So the system had fallen apart and Baldwin's going to change it. And this is the instruction sheet. Um, so class B is one pair of drivers. Class C is two pairs of drivers. Class D is three pairs of drivers. Class E is four pairs of drivers. We cannot at this moment envision a locomotive with five sets of drivers. Instead of the old tonnage rating, we're going to do it by cylinder size. We've got this lovely explanation of how we get 22 to equal a 14 inch diameter cylinder. And for ours, we're in the 26 and 28s, um, which has to do with taking the diameter of the cylinder minus three and then times two. Nobody said Baldwin's system was easy. Okay. Um, but one of the things I love about looking at original documents was this note over here. And he's talking about this, I think. He may be talking about the whole system. 
this good rule is of no good anymore. <laughs> that right there is going to explain some of the problems that Jim and I will have answering paint questions because Baldwin was in flux. And what is true one time is not always true again. So back to our catalog. Um, our friends from the V&T are going to be right in here. 26D, 28D locomotives. Um, we're standardizing. And like I say, it happens right in with the last two of the um, wagon top boiler moguls. Um, kind of compare the two, their numbers, their V&T numbers. I call them heavy and light, but heavier only slightly heavier. Um, one of the things is drawing numbers. This is part of the Baldwin system as we come to this point. Um, because that 828D tells you that the thing has eight wheels. 28 is the size, D is that it has six driving wheels. There's an assumption in this system that any wheels that are not driving wheels are lead wheels. They have a second system that we don't need to worry about that says if I put a third over it, then the wheels are split between the front, that any lead wheels are split between the front and the rear. And if I put a quarter after it, the system gets complicated. But for our purposes, know that if it has eight wheels and it has a D, there's a two wheel lead truck. The drawing though, the problem is that that only tells you that you've got a 260 of a certain size. For those of you who like narrow gauge, it doesn't tell you if it's outside frame or inside frame. It doesn't tell you if it's a wagon top boiler or a straight boiler. Um, there's lots not told. And so for any engine, there's a series of drawings. And generally, the lower drawings are the first couple put out. And so we know that for Empire, it's built to drawing two because it says so on the spec sheet. Okay, right here, we have drawing two. But if we look at this one, this is Comstock again, there's no drawing number. If we assume it's two, they're identical engines, but nothing told us that. Until I found, back in the Book of Laws, the 828D, and this is, so 828D, the first one built, the second one built, the third one built, the fourth one built, the fifth one built, and down here, the second and third, uh, the third and fourth are Virginia and Truckee. It's Virginia and Comstock. And over here, they've written in, in a different color ink, as the system has changed the drawing number. So we have confirmation from Baldwin's records that they understood that and are trying to push that idea back. Okay, so specifications and paint streets. So I'm gonna look at some of the information. This one's Bowker. And I chose Bowker because it has such a wonderful description of paint styles. Um, the moguls aren't as good at it, and they, they vary. So this sheet, we're looking at this portion down here, painted uh, brass plate letters on the cab, Bowker, number 21. Um, we're looking at mark. Remember, you're not allowed to use RR unless the spec sheet tells you to. It's wine color style one, okay? Now we're finally getting into the Book of Decoration. Um, wine tells you the color they're gonna paint it. Color is not a reference to wine. It's a reference to the lettering color. No, you're shaking your head. That's the way it works on narrow gauge engine. <laughs> the reason I'm saying that, and Jim, this is the problem we go back and forth, is that my understanding is color means we're using yellow paint instead of He's going to rebut me in a minute. <laughs> I can see both sides now. Yeah. If, if it says wine color, that's a description of the wine. But later they will add, they'll get more specific and they'll say wine and gold style one or wine and color. So if there's an ampersand, it refers to that. See, so we have these differences. So this one's wine color paint, and we're not necessarily saying gold leaf. We've got style one. Now that's going to be the stripes. Um, Details of the engine, general finish. Early on, it's best finish, or good finish. Okay, best finish, K4, when we get to that, is a series of sheets from the law books. And if you go through, it will say brass, 
nose on the running boards, brass nose on the tender, or it might say iron nose on the running board, painted. For each of these classes, what do you paint, what do you polish? Okay, so, so what is the paint book? Book's kind of a misnomer. Um, it is a single two volume book. It's huge. It was handmade and it lived in the paint shop. So if you are the Baldwin Locomotive Company and you have city blocks and city blocks and city blocks of facilities in Philadelphia, and it may be that your painters may not read English, um, how do you tell them what you want each engine to look like? And after we get past Best Passenger, we start to create the paint book. And the paint book is some 300 plus painting styles, and it is page after page after page of examples. How to stripe a dome, how to stripe a tender, um, how to stripe a cylinder, how to paint a driver. And okay, these aren't direct instructions. There's an assumption the painter is an intelligent, skillful painter. So if you see a tender, he's supposed to look at it and say, okay, the stripe should be proportional about that, and he is supposed to adjust it based upon the size of the locomotive. There are some limitations. The arabesques here are probably done with a pounce pattern and a stencil, so they don't necessarily change size, but we expect this painter to have skill, and this is our way of communicating. This book, by the way, is paint spotted because it is in the paint shop. Uh, books at Stanford, and it is available to use. There are color slides at CSRM if you want to go over it. Okay, so back to Balker. We have style one. So what is style one? We go to the first three pages of the first volume, and there's style one. It is, they don't specify a cab. They tell us it is cylinder one. It doesn't have a tank on the boiler. It's not a saddle tank. Sandbox number one, driver's number one, tender tank number one. If we go down a couple, style three is cylinders one, sandbox two, driver's two, tender tank two. So this book, we can simply change. If you want to have an engine with red drivers with blue fill, we go down to style 27, yeah, um, which is style one with red drivers. Okay, so this is a way of transmitting. They can also say red drivers in the specification sheet. So this is a challenge. You've got, you find some information, you think you understand the system, and it keeps changing. So 300 plus styles, there's three pages of style sheets. Okay, so back to it. Style one is used on Bowker. It's gonna be dome one, driver one, tank one, Cylinder one. Here, uh, one of the later ones in style one, one of the later mobiles, we can see a tender. See, you really can't see it there. We can, it's hard to see the shine here, but let's see how it translates. There's the style one tender as it appears in one of the heavy mobiles. We have some examples of style one that we can go look at. Uh, Sonoma at CSRM, Eureka, wherever she may be. And here is Empire. Kind of doled up and pretty, maybe. She may be like one of those guys who has a car that he takes to car shows, but he never puts it on the road. And when it goes to the car show, it's in a trailer because he wouldn't want to bug on it. I tend to think of this engine, you need to remember when you look at it, this engine may be that, that overly perfect, more perfect than it looked. So now this comes up to some questions of color. We've got words like wine. We've got words like lake. Uh, we've got olive green. These are, are dark green. It varies in name over the years. And we need to understand kind of where Baldwin was coming. Baldwin understood those. So in the paint book, not indexed into the styles are headlights. 
There's three pages of headlights, 31 headlights, I think. Um, but the headlights are the only portion of the book where our friends write up on top what they are. Oh, this one's my favorite. If you're telling a painter how to paint an engine, and you don't want him to put stripes or decoration, how do you do it? And I haven't checked, I've got to go and check Baldwin's records and get the name of their painters from census data, because I'm going to guess they're Italian or some other ethnicity and may not be entirely English speaking. So instead of saying no stripes and worrying about communication, we'll tell them headlight number four. Nothing. There is a dome like this. There is a tender like this. So if you do not want it decorated, you just specify the version that isn't decorated. Um, in these, while they give us the same thing sometimes with different color names, um, like I say, headlights are unusual, um, there's no reason if this, well, this one says wine or link. Um, if they specify and color and gold, um, Yesterday we talked about Tuscan red maybe being similar to wine. It's similar, but it's not. This is a Tuscan red headlight. So it is a different color in Baldwin's version. And again, a problem that you've got carriage painters, you've got locomotive painters in a tightly controlled environment. Each of them has their own view of things and their own way of visioning. Wouldn't you love this one? Lovely pink. Um, so, the little moguls in paint. This brings us to our big, big problem. Instead of telling a style, whoops, that I can go backwards, oh, I could. Um, wine color, general finish, good. Um, these guys aren't going to tell us much about this engine because this is in the transition. Remember this engine, these happen to be Empire and uh, yeah, and Esmeralda. These are eight 26 Ds. These are not the 27 and a half Ds. But we're seeing this transition. We've, we've made the change on the class number. We haven't made the change on the paint information system yet. Because as these systems get more complicated, we have to start changing them. This will be here. Jim's problem. We'll let Jim talk in a minute. <laughs> so I'm going to go off and talk a little bit about the moguls in general and how they were, something about their service life. And what, this is just the moguls. It's got their date built and the date they come out of service. And what's amazing, I've highlighted in red the last two. So Virginia is last used in 10, scrapped in 18. Empire sees some use in April of 18 and sold by 24. The reality is the moguls represent the beginning on the VNT. And by the turn of the century, the VNT had turned to Americans and the later Baldwins. Um, so this is something to remember. The moguls on the VNT don't see the later paint schemes, or nearly as much. They were really short lived. In fact, if you look, um, Ormsby is sold off in 75 before the last of the Baldwins even arrive. So the mobile era is pretty short and it represents a different area. Don't get mobiles and McKean's. Um, so the case study Washoe, and this is what she looked like at the end of her life in Washington. These engines change, and this is the other thing. What they look like the day they come out of the factory and we can do that with, say, the style one, it's harder with the other styles, is not what they're going to look like 30, 40 years later. Um, Virginia, and what Virginia ends up looking like. These are not the same engine. Um, so we have to make some decisions. So I'm going to make a quick thanks, particularly Jim. There's a cast of thousands over here, you know, most of them. Um, some sources. Um, never forget BB. BB's wonderful. Not necessarily accurate, but God, he can describe things. So, uh, Jim on the mobiles, and we'll need to change over to the other PowerPoint. Randy, before you disappear, on the Balker Arter sheet, underneath K4, it refers to the James. 
as the number nine. It, it, that not only that. Does that refer about to the finish or the No, this is a common thing with Baldwin is, um, and look, by the way, the style book, style number one, I have never seen that referenced in a sales order. The question was, on the Bowker specification sheet, at the bottom it refers to James. And when one of the common ways of telecommunicating to Baldwin salespeople was to say, I want a 242 just like the last one I got a few years back. So the reference to James is going back there. And the interesting thing is, in between, We've changed so that Bowker and James are six, what size? Sixteens? Six, it, I don't remember their size number. Uh, Bs for driving wheel, or Cs for driving wheels. On If you go back to James's spec sheet, someone's handwritten on it, the modern class number over the old class number because they've been referring to it apparently. Baldwin sheets are full of pencil notes. Um, so they were using, we want an engine like James, we're like, we're happy with James, let's build one. The other part though is that, like I say, style one, we don't go to the customer and show them the style book. The style book was used only in the paint shop. So we talk to a customer and they say, I want something fancy. And we have kind of what we've used best passenger in the early era of the V&T to say we want the fancy paint job. It evolves over time. We kind of firm up fancy as style one for a period, and it ultimately will become style 49 when we change the tender. And that will become best passenger. We don't tell the customer he's not getting style one, he's getting style 49, although some customers say I want it exactly like that, so style ones appear later. One of the Baldwin order sheets also early says finish fancy for Western Road. I don't remember what locomotive that is. Denver Pacific, showing for the West. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, he was asking about best finish for Western roads. So Jim's going to handle it. Got <laughs> <laughs> a question for Yes. Why don't we let Jim go back to the question. Balker thing? We were talking about wine, color, and whatever came after that. If there is a comma, and it looked like there is after the word wine. You may actually have two different things there. But the comma was that the comma. All right, because Baldwin, you basically see Baldwin begin to evolve its system. The question is, you know, does a comma designate, you know, how does it work? Well, Baldwin is learning as they go. They kind of developed a system. No one is perfect. You don't have a 747 at Kitty Hawk. You know, it's just that nice, nice, simple thing. So they first write, you know, wine color, you know, and that's enough. And then they say, oh, wine color style one. And then they kind of say, okay, we should specify whether it's real gold striping or imitation gold striping. So they now drop the term wine color because that could be confusing. And they say wine and gold style one or wine and color style one. And color is basically an imitation gold, which is similar to um, a best uh, comparison is deluxe gold that was used later on. You know, so there's, it's very specific. But you get, one of the joys I get, and this is like a really small thing, but I like it, is seeing Baldwin's thinking develop. And we're probably gonna do that because I, what Randy considers a problem is a lot of fun for me. So I'm gonna look at Mogul's, the color schemes before they're absolutely specified, because we don't know everything, but we know a bit, and I think this would be a particular interest to you, but it'd be a lot of fun. Uh, just to sort of see this stuff. So you know, the engine in the corner to the right, you obviously know that. That's a style one wine color uh, mobile. This one is going to be really tricky. Actually, it seemed to be tricky. The striping is still a tricky part, but the colors we're now pretty close to. So I want to, first off, before we get to Baldwin, give you a mindset of this era, because we're going to go back to the 1860s and start there and work our way up rather than looking back. I think it's better to do it that way because you clear out a lot of clutter. This is an 1860s uh, New Jersey <coughs> Locomotive Works uh, mobile. 
uh, built for the Erie Railway. This is a six-foot gauge engine. I think this is a really spectacular piece of machinery. This is called a three-color locomotive. Around 1850, uh, 1848 to 53, the uh, American locomotive industry was changing. Uh, a lot of new mileage was coming up, and all these nice, simple, green, British-style machines were no longer really saleable on the market. A huge buyer's market was developing, or seller's market was developing, but you had to have really fancy locomotives, and so you started adding red wheels. The first red wheels we know from American engines appeared in 1852. Uh, three color locomotives start to appear, and four, sometimes five color locomotives. What I found in going through the Halsey drawings in the Erie Railway, as well as a couple of other collections of drawings from the 19th century, is that there are definite patterns. We can see these patterns repeated across the country, and they clearly are evidence of railroad men and railroad shop painters talking to each other and coming to a common consensus about what is right. And it really is one of those if A, then B situations. So here we have, whoops, ah, well, that's another one. We'll get back to her later. This is a you know, typical example. This engine is painted green frame and green dome bases, headlight, bell stands, all the stuff that's related to the boiler. That constitutes the locomotive. The boiler is the heart of the locomotive. Rogers even numbers engines by its boiler numbers. So let's take this boiler as the heart of the engine, and all the stuff that's directly related to it is the same color. The wheels, trucks, and cow catch are auxiliary elements, so those are painted red, and then the cab, domain, uh, cab uh, headlight, and tender are painted this really, really dark blue-black. It's kind of like a major case of drop black right there. And this is a classic pattern, cab headlight tender. My friend Ron, John Davis and I, who, and John Davis is the fellow who lives in Washington, has been doing the drawings of Glenbrook and some of these others. We have a whole catalog of shorthand that we refer to these machines. And this is a cab headlight, headlight tender machine. Now the sandbox, which is painted bright red, is a wild card. In this type of style, the sandbox can be painted anything. So this is a uh, engine as it appeared in 1868. This style was not used on the VNT outside of maybe like the booth engines, but not really on the Baldwins. But it gives an idea of what was going on. This locomotive is built by Rogers. This is an anthracite burning locomotive. You can see it's nice. Uh, anthracite boiler right there, you know, a nice wacky firebox um, situation. This locomotive, when new, was originally painted wine color with ultramarine blue panels on the tender and vermilion wheels. This is the engine as it appeared two years down the road, and the crew has completely repainted it into a new ski scheme, which is nice and serviceable. Wine wheels, green frames, there you have this same, you know, sort of green stuff around the boiler. And then this is painted black. This is an early example of black being used as a color. And all of these are very serviceable paints on a locomotive which is burning coal, on a, on a railroad which wants to have good appearance engines, but sometimes wants to have a nice efficient appearance engines. So this is the mindset that we're working into, and this is the mindset that was being produced, you know, produces the bald ones that will eventually you know, be bought by VNT. Now this is a nice little engine. I put this one up. This is Lehigh and Susquehanna number 41. This is built by Baldwin. This is an 1868 Baldwin. This is as it looked in 1870s, two years down the road. It's got a nice original style. You can, you're going to recognize this design on the tender as being a Baldwin design. We know that this engine had black wheels when it was new. Black wheels were a fashion in the early 60s among the Philadelphia builders. It was old fashioned by 68, but Lehigh and Susquehanna re requested it. But they immediately changed their mind to red. The later orders for Lehigh and Susquehanna are red. So we can tell that they repainted this engine in kind. It also has the old style Baldwin <laughs> domes. That year, a lithograph was coming out from Taunton, Massachusetts from some guy named Mason of an engine called the Highland Light. And the Baldwin staff liked it so much that they began to copy Mason's dome profiles. And these are the dome profiles that you see on the Virginia trucking Baldwins. Mason was so pissed off that he began to paint his engines green to contrast with what he called those brown Baldwins. <laughs> the Baldwin color at the time is largely a sort of umber color, but this is very similar to wine color, which is just beginning to be used. 
And so there's a very, you know, Baldwin takes subtle shifts from one color to the next. Never big substantial leaps. It's always a kind of a subtle thing. And this drawing kind of shows that effect. Also, it has a round front cap. Isn't that nice? There's some really nice stuff going on. Now let's, this is a three color locomotive. This is brown upper works, red wheels, and a black frame and black headlight. The black frame is an 1850s New England style used, which was used by one New England builder, again, William Mason, into the 1870s and 80s. And the Mason locomotives delivered to the Central Pacific, apparently so influential to Andrew Jackson Stevens, who copies the Mason bell stand, that he seems to have copied Mason's arrangement of frame and headlight bracket. Now, the frame and headlight bracket is a known style. And there's an example of a northern central locomotive painted black with red wheels with a green frame and headlight bracket from the same year that this locomotive was built. So this is a kind of a, a thing. These guys must have known these things. I mean, there's, also, there's must be you know, immense seas of unwritten knowledge that these guys kind of had. And we have, we, this is the, these things are the only way we can figure them out. So let's go to Baldwin in the 60s. This engine was built for Havana, Cuba. She has uh, louvered windows, which I think are probably really nice in the uh, hot weather. She has black wheels, striped with gold and red stripes on the rims. Black wheels, a very saucy, early 60s Baldwin, Philadelphia, Norris style. Also very popular on the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad under William Laird. And, I'm sorry, and under Laird. All Penzi engines were painted umber with green frames and black wheels. Penzi had a lot of common uh, stock with Baldwin, who had a lot of common stock in Pennsylvania. They talked to each other, and a lot of things that are going on between the two builders are really noticeable. Penzi eventually develops its own locomotive designs that it copies the Baldwin dome profiles, which is another reason Baldwin changes their profiles so they won't be mistaken for Penzi engines. Now, this is a good example. This is a Northern Central locomotive built in 62. Uh, this is a good example of this separate paint book, which is kept in the painter shop. It says, painted in dark colors, no gold. Thank you very much. There's, you know, we know that they want this to be a freight locomotive. This is ordered by the Pennsylvania Railroad for the Northern Central in late 61. Uh, there is a uh, huge rush of traffic because of the onset of the Civil War. These engines were numbered but not lettered and numbered in the respective rosters of the Penzi and the Northern Central, so they could, I believe, so they could be pooled in an event. We could, if we recreated this engine, make a fairly nice stab at the colors, but ultimately this type of documentation doesn't leave us with much. Now, here we're on, we're on a few years, and now I can give you a couple ideas. In the 1870s, this, Baldwin has a single color with a, a single factory standing color at any given time with different striping. In the 1860s, you have three color schemes floating around at any given time. Umber with green frame and red wheels, bronze green with green frame and black wheels, actually really sexy scheme. And umber with a plum cab and tank that's dark purple, uh, green frame and red wheels. So this was very popular, say, with the Western Atlantic and a number of other builders. This seems to be the, the one that we see in the Lehigh and Susquehanna, you know, type locomotive. And this, with the plum cabin tank, who would order something like that? Well, the Lehigh and Susquehanna. This is the Wapalapin, uh, 1865. She's got a plum cab. The fact that they te tell you that the cab is plum but nothing else tells you that there's being painted in different color schemes. This is a really neat looking engine. It's kind of like a stretch Virginia. Now, this is the consolidation, uh, the consolidation, the very first 280. Uh, and wheels red, house and tank, plum color. You know, one side of the tank. You can tell that this has green frames, the tank and the house, dark purple, big, big battery or red wheels rolling down and all this as a means of showing off the very first of the new design. They wanted this new powerful freight engine to be on display for everyone who saw it so that everyone would know that Lehigh Mahanoy and Lehigh and Susquehanna meant business. Now this is the Oakland. This is 1870. Uh, this is a particular note because this is a very close to the very early Virginia trucking mobiles. It simply says, best finish. 
Now that's really great. There's a lot of, by the, you know, there's a lot of Baldwin orders that are like this. They don't say much. And I want to assure you that it's kind of a red herring to see, to think that best finish refers to the color scheme. It doesn't. It doesn't refer to the color scheme at all. Um, it simply refers to the treatment of the materials around the engine. You know, a little nicer treatment on, on overall. I looked at this intently. I compared, I've looked at every single locomotive Baldwin built in the 60s in this book and so on, and I found no evidence that best finish can refer to anything other than the materials. It'd be great if it, you know, if it did to cut through the paint, but it doesn't. So it kind of leaves us with attempts to put something like this, wine color best finish. This is the Baldwin Center paint book. This is not bald and spec sheet, but a paint book from the paint shop. V, C, and T, R, R, the lettering, you know, and so forth. How to number the thing. And it shows us this new color, it's called wine color. It shows us that. So let's take a look. Wine color is used, is introduced in September 67 for some wheels of an engine, used up to 30, 1871, intermittently with, say, umber and other colors. And then it becomes factory standard around 1871 to May 1875. You know, it's really kind of telling that like sometimes you'll see engines that say, you know, wine color on tank from 1870. That kind of in indicates that wine color was only an option. It was perhaps something, a best option. I doubt that the VNT actually wanted wine. They simply wanted the best, and wine might have been pretty good. This is how we would reconstruct Virginia. This is uh, Virginia, as she looked, uh, out shopped in 69. She has wine color above. The frame and trucks are painted green with black striping. The trucks survive today underneath the Empire. And the paint found in those is a dark Brewster green with black stripes. This confirms what we see in those Halsey drawings, those watercolors of the Baldwins and of other patterns. The real color is unknown. We do not know, but as other engines appear to have red wheels, and as Baldwin used red wheels even when they were not specified at this time, it's a fairly safe you know, reconstruction. So here's a couple beauty passes of, of this engine. I think she's really great looking. You can see too that we've reconstructed this tender panel design you know, that you saw in those Lehigh and Susquehanna engines. It's a Baldwin style. It was very popular in 69. There you can see a little bit of ornate scroll work there, and there's this wonderful sort of, it's as if, a, you know, a starfish just sort of landed and just gripped the top of that dome base. We know from photographs that those are in alternate colors. We don't know what those colors are. There was one of these domes entered into the Baldwin paint book much later for an amusement park engine at Coney Island. And it was red and blue, so we have used that scheme here, right there. It seems like they re, you know, redid old time schemes at that point. This is the tender. You can see this pattern. And what I think is really interesting is this pattern is, shows up later um, you know, on the Dayton. It shows up later on the Glenbrook. It shows up in a very vernacular form on late Virginia trucking locomotives in 1880s shop style. I think that is a clue that suggests that perhaps this style made it to the Virginian Truckee. There we go, there's our uh, Lehigh and Susquehanna friend. And here is a Tioga engine. This is from the early uh, 70s, varnished cab. You have the new uh, basin style domes. This one has a really nice finish, has extra brass on the sandbox, which is really exceptional. But again, it has the green frames. It has the old style wheel covers right here that are etched in brass. Those are kind of like going out of fashion by 70, 73. And it has a really nice overall design. I think this is a good example of Baldwin's best passenger finish. Now this is a little dinky uh, uh, locomotive built for an iron company, but it shows really nice detail. And a lot of details that the first Virginia trucking mobiles would have had. The Williams headlight, ornately painted. The ornate paint scheme on the sandbox this wonderful design on the tender, a very good example of it. There we have a nice detail. Now because this engine has rigid trucks, the trucks are painted wine color, or umber if this engine was painted umber, 
because when the rigid pedestals do not lend themselves to a contrasting green, you know, if, the, if this tender was placed upon swiveling trucks, they would have been painted green. So there we can get, again, the design. And here it is, this green trucks. Now, this is a little feature about Baldwin. They were striped in black when they were delivered, but the Virginian truck, he repainted them probably around 1871. Uh, and they restriped them in white and blue. And I think this says a lot about the capacity of the Virginian Truckee Railroad to maintain its uh, freight engines in the best style and improve upon the builder's style. You know, we saw this reference that was found, I think, by Stephen. Did you find that? Or, you know, and it was so tempting. We really wanted to know what this thing looked like. And John reconstructed it, and we discovered it was really pretty good looking. Now, we can reconstruct the color fairly well, but the striping pattern is not specified. So the best we can do with stripes is say, what is most likely or what is possible for a given locomotive? This is the design that we've talked about before. It's possible for Virginia Truckee 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. This is what I call the Greek key pattern. This was outright stolen from <coughs> William Mason. Mason just loved Baldwin. As long as, you know, as long as Rhode Island was copying Mason's designs, it was a small builder, everything was fine. But when you get this big, aggressive, powerful company in Philadelphia doing it, Mason was a little concerned. <coughs> this design may have been on some of the VNT engines, like 6, 7, 8, and 9, uh, and 9 and 10. And then we have this striping pattern, which again is a Mason style, uh, but becomes sort of universal. And this appears possible for numbers 10, 13, and 14. And this is a good example of the Greek key style on a St. Louis Vendelli and Terre Haute locomotive. Nice sort of ornate design going on there. And here's how it may have looked on the IE James. This is purely conjectural. We, we have no good side photos of this locomotive to confirm it. This is simply an exercise to you know, see how it may have looked. But you can see that this wide stripe lends itself to that construction. Now this, of course, was taken in 76. So this engine has been repainted and it got a lot of praise for its uh, paint scheme at the time. But it has a lot of similarities to this Greek key pattern that's shown here and there. Now this is the two-color Baldwin uh, of 1872, 71-72. Uh, Around 71, Baldwin seems to drop the green frames. It's still keeping the red wheels. And so we've reconstructed Washoe uh, in this manner. And we've put on these stripes based upon that photograph. Again, it might have had the Greek key pattern. It may have had this, this style right here. But it's a nice, simple engine. It's coming into more of what you've seen with the Empire. And it's a process of Baldwin simplifying their production to meet increased demand. If you only have one color of paint on the floor, at any given time, you can get that thing painted a lot faster rather than having to make separate batches of green. And here it is overhead. And here you can see these great starfish up here. Now, we don't know how long those lasted, but they seem to have gone away around this time. This would be about the last that they could be conceivably possible for. And then they're replaced by the design with those little diamonds that you've seen on some of the other locomotives, the later engines. Here you can see something which is not part of the paint scheme but is really important. This run board is done in a kind of mineral paint. This is a, a plain, plainly finished paint. This surface gets uh, scuffed up. You're not going to put your good paint on that with all those hobnail boots you know, banging around on it. It's going to have to get repainted quite a bit. So we, those parts are oftentimes painted in different colors. Here's our tender with, a, with a, what would be known as a card two tank. And this is the number two tank that is part of the Style 3 freight from the, from the Baldwin books that uh, Randy just showed. I really like that someone at Baldwin was bored and decided to do a little shading on the number. And this is a good example of what uh, Washoe, Empire, and Esmeralda may have looked like when they were new. Uh, this is a uh, uh, consolidation, narrow gauge consolidation locomotive built for the Rio Grande but not delivered to it. It was uh, redirected to the East Broadtop where it became known as the Broad Hill, Rock Hill. 
Um, you can see this detail. You can see the red wheels, which are uh, clearly visible in this photograph. And we have some, now we have the modern diamond design and the arabesques. And we have this headlight that we saw yesterday as uh, being on the Glenbrook and a number of other locomotives with the very same pattern. It's kind of a consistent Baldwin feature. So this is a you know, good example of a typical freight. Now, it says nothing about the paint scheme on the spec, but we can tell from the photo it has X feature and X feature. Now, here's a final detail. The top of the tender and the inside of the water legs are painted in this uh, mineral paint as well. Because again, those surfaces are gonna get banged up. You're gonna be slamming that lid when you're filling it up with water. You're gonna be walking all over it. You're gonna repaint those things fairly frequently as part of general shop maintenance and not part of a paint you know, scheme. So you're not gonna put your nice you know, varnished wine color all over this stuff. You're gonna save your money and you know, use a lot of logic. It comes up just about as far as that riveted sheet. There's a line of rivets right here. From that rivets, forward, you can see the stripes coming forward. That's where the good paint starts. And then the mineral paint starts right there and then continues back. And you can see this in builders' photographs. So I want to just give you a little bit of